Today, I'm going to talk about a game called Raptor Call of the Shadows, if you couldn't tell by the title. And this holds a very special place in my heart, because I played it when I was really starting to get invested in these retro games in the late 2000s, sometime during my middle school days. I found this one as a shareware on the Duke Nukem 3D disc and was instantly hooked to this game. And this is one that's still very highly loved by fans today, and for good reason. Though it's not by any means a perfect game. Raptor's legacy continues to live on today, maybe not as strong as Doom's or Duke Nukem 3D's, but it's still quite stronger than your typical DOS game. Why is that, and how did this thing get birthed? Glad you asked, let's take a look. So back in the early 90s, there was a game designer named Scott Host, and not much is really known about his past, but he created the game called Galactics, a top-down shooter, and it caught the attention of Scott Miller, the head and founder of Apogee Software. Miller called Host and made a deal with him to make a very early 3D RPG game called The Second Sword, which was based off of id Software's Shadowcaster engine. During this time, the Scots had another deal for Host to work with his own game company, Cygnus Games, for another top-down shooter. This was called Mercenary 2029. Also, fun little fact, Cygnus was in the same building that id Software was working in during the development of Doom and Doom 2. Yeah, Cygnus and id were actually pretty cool with each other, being literal neighbor studios. In fact, one day, the two groups decided to go and catch a movie together. This movie was actually the first Jurassic Park movie and led to them thinking that Raptor would actually be a much cooler name, since Raptor is, you know, the name of a type of aircraft. And thus, Raptor was born, being under the tagline, Raptor, this ain't no dinosaur game for the marketing. As Raptor was being worked on more and more heavily, the focus for Second Sword decreased drastically more and more, until eventually it was completely abandoned in favor of Raptor. Kind of a sad fate, because I think that game would have actually been pretty cool. Oh well. Anyways, Raptor's tagline eventually changed yet again from this ain't no dinosaur game to Call of the Shadows. I don't know about you or anyone else, but I think Call of the Shadows sounds much more badass. Though I also thought this ain't no dinosaur game was a pretty cool one too. By the time they finished the game, it blew up the shareware scene, maybe not as much as Doom, but still quite a bit, and you're gonna see why. With today being the game's 25th anniversary, holy crap, I'm getting old, I felt it'd be a perfect time to discuss it. The game was shipped out April 1st of 1994, and no, that wasn't a joke, even though most people thought so at the time. It was distributed by shareware, mail order, and retail, with both jewel case versions and box versions being produced. This over here is the retail box distributed by Formgen, and it's absolutely beautiful. Also, quite the collector's piece nowadays. The front cover looks beautiful, the classic Apogee stuff is on the side, and the back shows some pretty noteworthy screenshots and points. Feel free to pause it if you need to. I was really lucky to get a fair deal on the sealed copy, so I'm gonna do the unimaginable and open up a sealed Raptor box. Inside, you get a cardboard box, finally, instead of the usual Apogee styrofoam blocks. This, an Apogee registration card, an ad, a full color manual that I can never get enough of, honestly, and three three and a half inch floppies. If you want to get one for yourself, they're pretty tough to come by, and the value really varies. I paid about 60 euros for mine, but I've seen opened copies going as little as the 20s and as high as the freaking 200s. <laughs> It's a pretty big price difference. So, I mean, really, it just depends on what you want to pay for it and how much time you're willing to put aside to hunt this thing down. Personally speaking, I don't think you should pay anything over a hundred for a sealed, minty fresh copy, but that's just me. As I said, it also came released in jewel cases, both in the yellow Apogee case and the jewel case Wizard Words re-release, both of which are actually also pretty tough to find. Those are typically around 20 to 40 bucks, but I say you should only grab one of those if you're an obsessive collector or something. The box is much more worth hunting down in my opinion, especially for the lovely artwork in the full color manual. If you want to get one of the jewel case releases just for the sake of having it, you're honestly probably a lot better off getting the digital one instead. It's much cheaper, much more easily accessible, you're supporting the original devs, and you can play the thing right away. There's several digital versions though, go figure. If you get it directly from the 3D Realms website, it's $6.99 and it's the original DOS version. If you go on GOG or Steam, they're also 6 bucks each, 
with the GOG one containing the 2010 edition and the Steam one containing separate pages for both the original DOS version and the 2015 edition. This might be a little confusing at first, but I'll go over all the differences later on in the video. But those are the prices, and if you want to check this game out by the time I finish drowning this stuff into you, then it's up to you to decide which one would best suit you. Everything you're about to see is played and recorded from the DOS version, and the others will come up towards the end. So after you plop in the flops, install the game, configure your sound card, and launch the game, you'll finally be greeted by the classic Apogee fanfare. <laughs> You boys just don't get it, do you? Wait, what? That's actually one of the little easter eggs they toss into this game. If you play the game on the same date as one of the devs' birthdays, then you'll get this neat little drunken version of the theme, as well as that specific dev's attempt at making a noise like a monkey upon quitting. Oh, uh, hey there. <laughs> If you play it on any other day, you will get the standard fanfare. As you continue, you get this introduction of a ship shooting another ship, and that's it. Yeah, the story isn't important at all in this game, if you can tell. And then it drops you straight into the main menu. And man, <laughs> this song brings me back every single time. After drooling over that theme song, you can start or load a game, quit, view the credits and order info, or change the options. From here you can change the volume and stuff, and that's about it. Where are the options to change your controls? Well, you actually have to manually put in your control method in the config file. That's always fun, right? Luckily it's just a matter of typing 1, 2, or 3 into the config file, but that's not something you're going to know the first time around. The order info is also pretty cool, I guess. Well, maybe not, but it's pretty nostalgic if you grew up with the shareware like I did. The second you start a game, you pick a portrait, type in your name and call sign, and you're dropped into the hangar. Once you're here, you're given several options in this little sub menu. You're returned here after the end of every single mission, so when you are here, you can save the progress which you've made and load it under the name and call sign in the main menu at any time. You can visit the upgrade shop, which I'll get to soon, you can go back to the main menu, and you can send out your ship on a mission. If you decide to send out your ship, you're given four options. Each of these represent the corresponding episode, with nine levels in each of them. The autopilot option will just take you to the next mission, and if you click this every time you get into the menu, you can just play the game sequentially as it was meant to be. The others will pick the corresponding episode, or in this case sectors, to play them in any order, which is pretty cool if you ask me. You're basically given free reign in picking these however you want to complete them. Though you should probably play them and start to finish in order since sectors 2 and 3 require much more heavy firepower from the first one. So once you select your sector, you're off. And holy shit, this game is absolutely beautiful. Even by today's standards if you ask me. And it's really aged like a fine wine. Quality. The game runs in 320 by 200 res, 256 color graphics in VGA mode exclusively, even though it actually looks like it's in 640 by 480 and it still manages to look gorgeous. I really can't stress that enough. Look at this. Not only does it look great, but it feels great too. The controls are pretty responsive and you feel like you're really in control of your ship, something that's pretty damn important in games like this. It feels very responsive with the keyboard, but I prefer the mouse for these games due to the more precise movement. The mouse feels pretty responsive as well, but it feels almost like the game was made more so with the keyboard in mind. Not really a big deal though, because it's still pretty playable. You can also play with the joystick or Gravis gamepad if you want. For the keyboard controls, you just use the arrows to move, control to shoot, the numbers to pick a weapon or alt to cycle between them, and spacebar to launch a mega bomb. For the mouse, you move the mouse around to control the ship, you left click to shoot, right click to cycle through, and wheel click to launch a megabomb. 
Very simple stuff. Personally, I actually use both. I do use the mouse as I just said, but for switching the weapons I use the keyboard. This allows you to instantly select the weapon that you want to use, obviously, so it makes it much more convenient instead of cycling through them every single time you want to use something else. As with others of its kind, the gameplay is very simple, primarily playing like a typical top-down shoot-em-up. However, it's different enough to stand out on its own. For one, you use a chain gun that takes up a bit to kill enemies instead of these random huge blasts that kill them with the slightest touch, and you have a life bar instead of dying the second you get touched. This allows the game to be challenging but fair, unlike a lot of other bullet hell games. This is definitely not one of those, although they usually seem to be the first thing that people think of whenever they see top-down shooters like these. All you really need to worry about is killing whatever you see on the screen, consisting of aerial targets and ground targets, and getting your ship through the levels, or waves as the game calls it, with as little damage as possible. You'll want to be pretty careful since your shields don't regain at the start of the next wave, and they carry on. So yeah, be very mindful about that. Obviously you'll die if your shield bar gets empty. Something I found pretty interesting is that if you go for more than 5 seconds without pressing the attack button, one of the little tiny bars on your shield bar will regain. It's a neat little mechanic that they tossed in there, but one I strongly advise against because it's always much easier to just shoot the enemy to prevent it from attacking at all. The explosions are all satisfying, and usually the game never makes you feel like you were cheap shotted. Also at the end of every single wave is a boss battle though it really just boils down to two different types of main bosses and three big final bosses at the end of each episode or sector. One of the two main ones just floats around like nobody's business and shoots in a specific pattern, stops, and repeats. Half of them are like this, and they're not hard at all or pose any sort of threat or challenge, and are pretty disappointing to me as boss battles. The other half of them are these things that are buried into the ground and shoot at you in another large but nearly unavoidable pattern, and they always annoy the living crap out of me. These bosses are easily some of the game's weak points, though the last bosses at the end of each episode were a pretty fair challenge, so I will give them that. The enemy design overall is, of course, mostly all of their ships. But they were very well varied, and the levels themselves are also varied pretty well, so it keeps the game feeling fresh and prevents it from feeling stale or too repetitive, which is a really nice touch, especially for a game like this. Now for what's probably the second most important part of the game aside from the gameplay is the currency system. At first, you might be mistaken for thinking that the number at the top of the screen is your score, but it's actually the money that you currently have. This game feels very arcadey, but it doesn't have any sort of score system. Even when finishing the game, you aren't asked to enter your initials for a score or anything like that. You gain money by destroying other ships, destroying buildings and other structures, and collecting certain items. This money that you earn is then used to buy more shields and heal your ship, purchase extra layers of shielding for your ship, or grabbing better firepower, the latter of which is probably something you'll really want to save up for. The money you get at the end of each wave carries onwards with you, though it won't if you quit the game mid-level but you can upgrade your ship whenever as long as you have the money. Usually, this leads to people just slowly upgrading their ship to get whatever they can afford at the time, and this gives it a slight RPG feel to it. It's very neat for the time, and something that's been replicated quite a lot in shoot 'em up since the release of this game. Speaking of weapons, they're all very powerful and also well varied, each with their own set of strengths and weaknesses and have their own time and place for being used, just like those 90s FPS games we all know and love. This is something that I personally haven't seen in another shoot 'em up, but then again I haven't played very many. But this selective usage of weaponry reminds me of something like those classic FPS games, and this game kind of feels like the doom of shoot 'em ups if that makes sense. I don't really want to go over every single weapon in the game, cause part of the fun is saving the money for the weapons and seeing how some of these things work for the first time around. But I think it would be fair if I at least go over what I think is essential. First off, there are weapons that are marked as always equipped. These are the ones that'll fire with your main chain gun no matter what. You want to get all of these because the more of these you have, the more firepower you have. 
Aside from these are the selectable weapons, which you would select by pressing the number or cycling through them. The twin lasers are the most powerful, and they'll probably last you the entire game. Though they're also very, very expensive, so you might want to get something more affordable in the meanwhile. So what I personally recommend doing is getting the Death Wave, which is extremely powerful but doesn't home in onto things, and the Tracker Gun and Tracking Laser, both of which do home in onto things. Though the laser is aerial only, but faster and more powerful, and the Tracking Gun is weaker and slower but attacks both ground and air targets. If you get those, you should have no issue playing through this entire game on the default difficulty setting. I felt like I should discuss the difficulty later on, rather than the beginning, because it would make a little more sense if I discussed it after showing how the game works and explaining most of the other stuff. So right after creating your character, you get four options to choose from. Training, Rookie, Veteran, and Elite. Training isn't necessarily training, but you're basically playing the shareware of the game, the entire first episode, with slower and weaker ships, and upon the completion of the episode, all of your credits will be pulled, though you do get to keep your weapons, and you get forced to start the rest of the game on Rookie. This is the real, easy skill. Slow enemies, weak projectiles, it's not really much of a challenge at all if you ask me. Veteran is the true difficulty that you should start out on. It can get quite challenging and chaotic, but it's worth every second of your time. Now, Elite is definitely possible, but it's pretty sadistic. This mode was really meant to be played during the New Game Plus mode. Oh yeah, speaking of that, that's another thing that I forgot to mention. Once you beat each episode, you can replay that episode on the difficulty higher than the one that you played it on. So if you play episode 1 in Veteran and then finish it, you can click the episode again at the selection screen and it'll start that episode on Elite. This is basically the New Game Plus mode. You play on a harder difficulty, though you thankfully get to keep all of your weapons. The Hangar Store isn't the only place you can get items. In fact, you can actually get some of them in-game. There's tons of weapons you can pick up, though the better ones are always going to be in the store. There's a little trick I discovered when I was younger and feel is worth mentioning, but I strongly advise against it if you're playing on a harder difficulty or it's your first time, because it can practically break the experience. You remember earlier when I said money doesn't carry on when you quit mid-level? Well, for some reason the weapons do. This means that if a level has a weapon pickup, like this for example, you can quit the level and restart the level and get it again, and now you have two in your inventory. Between levels, you can go to the shop and sell them for money. So in theory, by doing this, you can get technically unlimited money and get enough to get every single weapon in the game before you're even halfway through the first episode, which is just insane. I mentioned the bombs and the controls, and they're kind of what you'd expect for a game like this. They have this atomic symbol and kill practically everything on the screen except for bosses. You can also pick up shields to restore a small portion of your own, phase shields, which act as an additional coat of shielding over your ship's current one, and lastly you can also get money bonuses. Most of these will be these sparkling yellow star looking things and they're worth 50 bucks. Not much, but you should try and grab them anyways because everything counts in this game. You can also get actual bonuses scattered around, ranging from 30,000 to a whooping 122,000, so definitely be on the lookout for those. Holy shit. The music was done by someone named Matthew Murphy, and although he has very few games he's credited for, his work here is just absolutely stellar. Originally, I thought it was done by Bobby Prince for some reason. Take that as a compliment. Every single track in this game is very catchy, and it'll probably even distract you from the core game. It sure did for me. My favorite would probably have to be the main menu theme though, or the Wave 1 music. They're just way too catchy for their own good. The Apogee fanfare was done by Bobby though. This is definitely not the last time you'll be hearing his name on this channel, so expect to hear it often. Matt Murphy seemed like a good composer, but the only other games he's credited for doing is Galactics and Night Bomber. But regardless, this is definitely his best work in my opinion and something I feel is pretty underappreciated. Sure, Raptor fans love it, but I rarely see it get talked about which is kinda sad because this is probably one of my favorite game soundtracks ever. If you've played this game or have been paying attention to the music you've been hearing, you'd understand why. Something kind of random but fun worth noting is that this was the only game to feature the infamous Drunken Apogee theme, which I showed and discussed earlier in the video. And it's something I always love hearing, just because of how absurd and silly the whole thing is. 
and it's that one thing alone that'll instantly show you that these guys were clearly having a lot of fun when they were making this game, and that's something that I love. Making games should be fun. It should be passionate, it should come from the heart. Another neat little easter egg is that if you press all of these buttons on the selection screen, you'll encounter enemies like monkeys throwing coconuts at you or something, which is pretty neat. The only cheat I know of is pressing the backspace key to give yourself full health and the second most powerful weapon in the game. It's kinda stupid because it makes it effortless to cheat, and you can just press the damn thing by accident somehow and have to start the entire thing over. I don't know man, I think that could have been changed upon its release to be something harder to find. But it's no big deal, it doesn't really harm the game in any way, so it's whatever. Aside from the music, the sound is great. Everything sounds very crisp and explosive and powerful. It's just very satisfying when you play it. You'll see what I mean. Although you're not going to hear very much aside from the explosions and the sound of your ship beeping whenever you're low on shields. So I went over the original DOS version just now. What about the 2010 and 2015 versions? Well, first off, I found there's actually a separate Windows version that's often referred to as both the 1998 version and the 2002 version for some reason. But more formally, it's called the Windows 98 version, and I couldn't find a single place to download or try it out. Honestly, in terms of quality, that one seemed to be the best one. We'll probably never know though. According to Wikipedia, it's almost a direct port, but people were complaining of the ship moving half of the speed with the keyboard, making it significantly harder, as well as the mouse acting like garbage and not letting the player move to the rightmost side of the screen. Bummer. The 2015 version is released on Steam, which I don't have but I heard it's total garbage. It's based on the 2010 version on GOG. Both are legitimate Windows ports, not just DOSBox. Now, I do have the GOG one, and most of the purest Raptor fans will say that this is an absolutely terrible port and to avoid it at all costs. I disagree though. I think the music quality was a disgrace in comparison to the original, and the frame rate felt a bit choppier. But the controls were the same, the gameplay was the exact same, there was added controller support and an updated launcher to fit the widescreen resolutions, and there's an HQ filter you can enable as well. It looks a lot uglier than the original but it has these added particle effects when the ships get destroyed as well as new sprites and effects, which in turn is quite beautiful to look at. It might not be as good as the original DOS version, but I'll be damned to say that it isn't an overall solid port. People give it way less credit than what it's worth, which is kinda stupid if you ask me, since the game is still largely the same game with no actual gameplay elements changed, something that purists for other games will often complain to no end about. As for the 2015 version, like I just said, there's no real big differences. It's pretty much the exact same game, but on Steam and with exclusive achievements. Out of all of the different versions, I say stick to the DOS one for the best experience. If it's your first time trying it out and you want some fancier effects and controller support, then I say go for the 2010 version. Otherwise, MS-DOS Master Race. So for the two big questions, does Raptor still hold up today and should you play it? You're damn right you should. 
Despite the few issues that this game has, I think it's really aged like a fine wine, and it's totally worth playing today. It's an absolute blast to play from start to finish, and it's very, very satisfying. Aside from the general slightly buggy nature of this game, the only real complaint I have with Raptor, if anything, is the frame rate. It looks like it's running under 25 when the game looks like it could have felt so much smoother running it at 60. Maybe it was a thing to limit the power usage of the computers back then, who knows. Everything else just hits the nail so damn hard that you adjust yourself to that frame rate. The graphics are stunning, the sounds are crisp, the combat is so endlessly satisfying, the music will impregnate your ears, and there's a high replayability factor due to the challenge and the satisfaction of it all, so you'll get quite a bit of playtime throughout it. Sure, it's not perfect, but it's one of the best shoot'em ups or shmups or whatever the hell you want to call them, and easily the best one for MS-DOS in my humble opinion. Though, some people will argue to no end that Epic's Tyrion is a much better one, but that's a time for another day. Raptor Call of the Shadows is a very solid experience from start to finish, and one that remains a largely loved cult classic to this day. So however you decide to get Raptor, I say go for it and play the shit out of it. You won't regret it one bit. But remember, this ain't no dinosaur game.